Well, I'm excited today. I've got some very special guests with us. Chad Robichaud, uh, you'll get to, if you haven't met him yet, you need to, and you'll hear his story. And then Aziz, straight from Afghanistan. We've heard a lot about Afghanistan, so we're going to let you set the record straight for us today. Chad, you are a retired Force Recon Marine, and I'm going to mess that up if I try to explain it. Why don't you tell the people how you served our country? Well, I was a Force Recon Marine. I did uh, eight deployments to Afghanistan. As eight? Po- eight? Eight, eight. Yeah. Okay. As part of a JSOC, a Joint Special Operations Command Task Force, and uh, working with you know, one of our premier special operations units in, in you know, I believe in the world. And I got the chance to, uh, to represent the Marine Corps at that unit and serve as an AFO, Advanced Force Operator, doing clandestine logistics to uh, to put assault on tar- assaulters on target to capture or kill bad guys. And and in that role, you were kind of work in undercover capacity, usually in a single team by yourself, with maybe with one or two other teammates. And Aziz was my interpreter and my culture advisor, my teammate, my friend. So you all and, uh, did a lot of life together. Yes. Without a lot of support. I mean, on your own, as I understand it, out in the mountains and yeah. remote parts of Afghanistan. Yeah, across the border into Pakistan. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, w- you working by yourself like that without a lot of military support because of the nature of the job. And you really have to rely on on your cultural and local expert. And that was disease. And uh, we spent, I always say we spent a lot of time, like if you ever ride in a car with someone on a long trip, just chew you in a 10-hour drive, at the end of that drive, you either love them or hate them. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, we've had a lot of those long drives and weeks and, and months together, just the two of us. So. Well, Aziz, we're going to learn a little bit more about your story. But, I mean, you were an interpreter, but you're really a freedom fighter. You had the courage to stand up with the Americans for the freedom for your people. So what did you think when you got that invitation? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you for having us. Uh, actually, from the childhood, I have this desire in my heart and this passion that whenever I find a chance to help my nation, my country, I would do it. I would do not hesitate and I would help my country. The Americans were there, they were fighting my fight. Like the Taliban, all the bad guys, Al-Qaeda or any other radical extremist terroristic group which was in Afghanistan, by the help of the United States military, uh, they were able to, you know, kill them or eliminate them or uh, remove them from Afghanistan. Instead, we received an opportunity to enjoy freedom, democracy, education, and all kinds of access for freedom, especially for the girls, which over the past centuries before the American presence in Afghanistan, the girls did not enjoy that uh, freedom, like especially going to school or college or becoming a journalist or a doctor doctor, especially during the two black eras of the Mujahideen uh, and the Taliban. So that itself motivated me to uh, put myself in the front line and defend my American buddies and uh, help them as much as I can so that uh, to contribute both politically, militarily, and socially to my home nation. All right. Thank you for your courage and for helping our troops. Absolutely. So I think it's safe to say, Chad, you'd be an expert on Afghanistan with eight tours. Yeah, I've been, been, a, big, a, big, a big, a big part of my, uh, you know, my adult life is in Afghanistan, and not just during the deployments. I mean, just, I mean, doing a job like I did, I had, I've done a tremendous amount of like research and studying and understanding wars from, you know, uh, Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great and and the Russians, and really understanding Afghanistan, the geopolitical climate of Afghanistan, how they interact globally. Uh, Afghanistan has always been a, a uh, one of the central points of uh, of the planet for uh, strategically, militarily. And how they interact with organizations like China and, and ISI, Pakistan Intelligence. So really feel like I understand Afghanistan, like you said, at least enough to warrant an opinion. And uh, I have a pretty strong one, too. <laughs> That's a good thing. We like people with opinions. Yeah. That's okay. So when we when the president announces the withdrawal, yeah, that it's time to get out of Afghanistan and he didn't want any American troops left there. Yeah. I think the average person listening probably not aware of how many mili- U.S. military are deployed around the yeah. globe, what that looks like. Mm-hmm. Did you think that was a prudent decision on his part? No, you know, Americans become war war weary very easily. And, and uh, you know, most of us, most true blooded patriotic Americans, we feel like the most important thing is here. We, we're, I think most patriotic Americans are somewhat nationalists and, and, and that's a good thing. But, you know, the strength of, of our nation allows us the opportunity to be able to be uh, – be able to help people around the world. And that's also a beautiful thing. And, uh, but in a place like Afghanistan, 
keeping our national security strong by our presence in Afghanistan uh, not only keeps the world strong, but it protects us by having troops there. And, and the American people, uh, with that war rearing us, the White House and the mainstream media capitalized on that, and they sold a lie to say that we were in this 20-year war, this endless war, and we have to get out of Afghanistan because it's not beneficial and American sons and daughters were dying. That was a complete lie and not true. And it was said so much that everyone believed it. I think most people believed it. I would I would not fault anyone for believing that lie, especially those who don't know. In fact, it's I hear it enough. I'm like, man, is, do we need to get out of there? But the truth is we had 2,500 troops there. In 2018, when President Trump dropped that mob, that mother of all bombs, the Taliban and the United States military uh, were not no longer in a kinetic fight with each other. The U.S. military shifted to a support and advisory role of the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police, and the entire international community came around the U.S.'s effort and, and did that at Bagram Air Force Base, and that actually worked very well, it, and it kept the Taliban at bay in the mountains of Afghanistan. It was working. And to give you context, when I say 2,500 troops, a lot of people might be like, yeah, we have 2,500 troops there. We need to get them out. I can name 12 places right now in the world that we have 2,500 troops that people don't even know about. Uh, we have 80,000 troops in Japan since World War II. We have 40,000 in Germany since World War II. We have 35,000 in South Korea. The reason we keep those there is because when the United States has a military contingency in areas that are unstable around the world, it brings stabilization and it makes the world a safer place. And it doesn't put us in wars. It keeps us out of wars. So understanding military strategy is really important to understand, did the White House make the right decision to withdraw the way we did? And, and the answer is no. We forfeited Afghanistan uh, as a strategic location. Kabul, Air, uh, the Bagram Air Force Base was the most strategic place in the globe between Iraq, Iran, Russia, and China. And like I said, the entire international community was there. And the White House didn't consult with anyone in NATO, the international, our international partners there. They found out on the news. Uh, we didn't, the White House didn't consult with the Afghan government that we spent 20 years and billions of dollars putting in place. The only people the White House talked to was the Taliban, our enemy of 20 years. That's the only people that we know uh, that they talked to. And they moved out our military, shut down our base, and, and and started a withdrawal before we even moved out our U.S. citizens and our allies that fought with us for 20 years. Uh, I personally, obviously I just expressed it, do not believe that we should have left. Um, I believe we should have hand, called a, declared a victory of the war, handed Bagram Air Force Base over to our international partners and supported the Afghan National Army ongoing like we do in other places around the world. But if we are going to leave, you don't give a date that we're going to exit. You don't move your military out uh, ahead of time and you don't leave behind thousands of Americans and our allies. You don't give a date. You give the Taliban terms. We will leave when we get every American out. We will leave when we get our allies out. We will leave when we get our $80 billion in equipment out. We will leave when we want to, not when you tell us we have to. You leave with strength. We leave with strength. We don't, we don't fly our, we, and Amer Americans don't fly our, our embassy staff off of a roof uh, in a retreat pulling our American flag down after 20 years of, of, of our service members building freedom in that country. And, uh, and, and we don't leave, we, we should never leave a place like we left it, but, but we did. And it created a catastrophe that cost American lives and left behind 40 million Afghans, 80,000 of our interpreters and made the world a much more dangerous place, including losing, losing credibility with our entire inter yeah, international wait community. Wait a minute now. I heard multiple times in the media, there was only about a hundred Americans left or a hundred yeah. of our friends. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, when the, when the, the White House House said that, when Secretary Blanken of the State Department said that, when the news said that, they knew that wasn't true. 100% they knew that wasn't true. If you go back and they were called out in the Senate hearings, when you go back and, and look at the White House's announcement, they said there was 16,000 Americans, which I believe there were more, but they said there was 16,000 Americans. And, and then they said they got out 6,000. And then they said there was 100 left. Now, I'm not a mathematician, but uh, I'm, better, I'm better than that. <laughs> Even in Tennessee, that math doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you know, I was, I was on the ground and I was on the news saying, hey, there's this 1,000 Americans still here. And, there, and there were, you know, people in certain news stations were calling me, you know, saying I was, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, sensationalizing. And, and the truth is like, there were thousands of Americans still there. You'd have to look at how the, the situation on the ground was. They had what's called a NEO operation, a non-combatant evacuation operation. And what a NEO operation is, is when in an area of the world, when, when things start falling apart, the ambassador has the ability to execute a NEO operation. That's one of the ambassadors like 911. And when he executes a NEO operation, the Department of Defense will launch a, a, a Marine Expeditionary Task Force to get out non-combatants from a, from a war-torn area. That's what the function is. They also could call in the 82nd Airborne because they have the ability to jump in and secure airfield move people. That's the NEO operation. The, the DOD does this, but the White House took that NEO operation away from the state, uh, from the 
Department of Defense and gave it to the State Department. So Secretary Blinken became in charge of a new operation, which they don't know how to do. It's not their business to do. There's a reason there's a difference between diplomacy and military uh, action. So they took the career. withdrawal. I just want to be sure. I'm, yep. Everybody's got this. They took the withdrawal away from the military who's trained to do it. Right. And they gave it to the State Department. Right. Which bungles just about everything they pick up. Always. <laughs> and if we, if we don't remember, Benghazi would be one good example. Yeah, good, yep. They kept the military out and they cost American lives. Yeah. And they entrusted that same inept State Department with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yeah, and essentially what the State Department did was treat it like a, if you imagine embassy, because that's what the State Department does. They protect embassies, ambassador homes, consulates. And so they treated it like an embassy and they, the airport became this kind of safe place for the American, the United States military and American diplomats and evacuation. And then uh, and then the U.S. military used as, as gate guards for that. So now the military is not being used to go out and rescue people. They're just protecting that perimeter and they're under the authority of the State Department. So the U.S. military is wanting to go out and rescue people, Americans and interpreters and, and, and women, women and children that are being executed literally in front of them, but they can't do anything because they're under the rules of the State Department and not allowed to. And so what that did was that the State Department negotiated to allow the outer perimeter of that airport to be given to the Taliban. And so the Taliban controls the outer perimeter. Anyone that understands military strategy knows that whoever chose the outer perimeter controls the ground space because they tr control who has access in and out. So when the White House is on the news saying, hey, if you're an American and, and you want to evacuate, you just have to get to the airport. Yeah. And, and, and what, they, what, they, what they're not saying is, what about this 20-year-old girl that went there to, to, to be a humanitarian aid worker, to work in a hospital, to teach English, to be a missionary? Now she, this 20-year-old girl, has to go to the Taliban and show her blue passport that she's an American. And, and meanwhile, the Taliban's cutting people's limbs off in the street. They're executing people. They're shooting people with crowd control. Uh, these are like barbaric, uh, like inhumane. These, these people are, are animals. Like these aren't, these, these Taliban fighters are not human beings. They're not. And, and this would, this what the white house is telling our Americans to do. And they didn't go. And I don't know, we don't know. And they won't, they don't know how many Americans are still out there imprisoned, enslaved, uh, were killed there. And that they are trying to keep that as quiet as possible. And we knew that people were being killed, killed in the streets there, put in cars, driven off to be executed. And, you know, and so there was no plan. And in the White House, Secretary Blinken actually asked the Taliban for more time. And the Taliban said, no, this is the same people that we that we were killing in the mountains for 20 years. And, and our White House and, and our State Department caved to the Taliban saying, no, you can't have more days. And these yeah. days they're trying to tell us through the media and the press releases, the Taliban are really just misunderstood. They're good people. We should make them allies. We gave them the Doha agreement. The Doha agreement said that they were not, they said they would not allow terrorism in Afghanistan. Well, the Taliban are terrorists. So the agreement is null and void from the beginning. But we've seen in the days they're moving up, they grabbed uh, 22 of our commandos that we trained, put them in the street and executed them immediately violated the Doha agreement. They went, started demanding to the, to the, to the mullahs uh, in the areas that they wanted a list of all little girl, little girls from nine years old to 45 years old to marry off as war brides and they started doing it right away like these are this is not like if, if anything this they say it's a new taliban yeah it's a new taliban because now they're they're empowered and emboldened and equipped and uh, and we've given them a country to pillage and and 40 million people were left there including eighty thousand of our our allies and um, the americans were left behind and and 20 million women and little girls that are being sexually enslaved they don't have any human rights like they can't a woman uh, maybe a pregnant mom can't even go to a doctor because one um uh, she's not allowed to see a male doctor. And two, women are allowed to be doctors or be trained to be doctors or be educated. So they have no human rights whatsoever. And like I said, little nine-year-old girls being drug off to be married to 50-year-old, uh, you know, barbaric men. And uh, I mean, clawing their parents to be pulled away. And, and the news, every, and I'm not being partisan here, every news station, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, every one of them should be ashamed of themselves because they won't show those videos of those little girls because they're, they're, they're cowardly uh, and they're not journalists. Well, there's there's no journalism. The it doesn't fit yeah. the narrative yeah. we've been handed. But the, the, the announcement that we were going to withdraw opened a new chapter in your life. Yes. Aziz, you'd, you'd been friends for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. He's still in Afghanistan. Now he's vulnerable mm -hmm. if we're leaving. And so you decided that you wouldn't just sit on your good intentions. Yeah. Which I, I don't know you too well, but I know you well enough. That's not likely to happen. Right. So tell me what led to your decision to get involved and how you did that. Well, I mean, you know, Aziz and all of our uh, allies over the 20 years were getting left behind. Um, he had been in the SIV process, the special immigrant visa process, which is supposed to take nine months, according to 2009 uh, policy. Uh, 
and he had been, we had been applying for him for six years. And, uh, and so I knew he was, we weren't going to get him out, uh, through the, and I know people in Congress have lots of friends that are congressmen and senators. I, I'm in Washington DC all the time. And even the strings I could pull, I couldn't get him out, uh, through dip, the, the diplomatic pathway. And so, uh, you know, I could not, I mean, this guy saved my life on three occasions. I've seen him save the lives of so many people, the courage that he had for his country, for America, uh, for fighting for freedom. Um, not only did I say he saved my life like on three occasions, but like every day. I was, I was saying last night, like, don't walk there. Don't eat that. Don't talk to that person. Like, if you talk right now, they're going to kill us. Like, he just kept me alive. And not only kept me alive, but he allowed me to be able to do my mission. He empowered me to be able to do the mission that I was tasked uh, by the United States military to do. And, uh, and successfully for eight, eight deployments. And we had an extreme amount of success on the battlefield. I mean, the command I was at was tasked with whoever's in the top 10 bad guy list. That's, that's our mission. Like if you make the top 10 list, we're coming to get you. And, uh, that was what, what our command did. And I could not have done my job w without disease. And so, you know, and, and, and in addition to militarily, like when we went out operating, I was at his home, like his wife, you know, Hatra cooked our first warm meal after coming out of the mountains. I held Mashuda and Mashuda, his oldest son and daughter as babies, like family to me. And so, like you said, I, I couldn't sit on my couch and, and, and watch see, uh, the news and, 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 and watch, you know, him die. Uh, and his wife and six kids die. I knew what happened to them. So I just made a decision like, Hey, this isn't even an option. Like I'm, we're going to get him. We're going to go get his ease. And, and we did. What'd your wife say? Well, my, my, at, at first my wife was, she, she was understanding. She's like, she was right there with me. She's like, I think, I think you have to, like she was, uh, I mean, obviously she was scared and, and didn't yeah. want to, but she's like, I think, I think you have to do this. And, uh, and, and it wasn't even a question at first. And, um, you know, we, uh, put together a team, about 12, special operations veterans that are very experienced people that I've known for a long time that have a lot of uh, experience in Afghanistan, doing these type of operations. They don't have a lot of ego left. They've already did their fighting. They're not going out there, going to want to go out there and fight the Taliban. They're going to want to, you know, rescue Aziz and his family. And, but as we put this team together and started planning it, we realized that it was much bigger and God burdened all our hearts, uh, especially when one of our team members recognized that 3,500 orphans had been, uh, been left uh, behind and they were going to be left to the Taliban. And we were like, hey, God's really burdened all of us to uh, to do more. And we made a decision to help as many Americans, women, children, interpreters, their families, as many people as we as we could. And uh, we didn't have a plan. Uh, we have the experience, but really that's like an impossible lift. Uh, but we were just obedient and just said, let's lean forward and do this. And, and God performed an absolute miracle that orchestrated the rescue of Aziz and his family and, uh, and 17,000 people. Wait. Aziz and his family and 17,000 people. You kind of slipped that in. That wasn't like just a bus road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that really, you, I mean, your willingness to go back launched an international relief response. It did. Yeah, it, it did. And, uh, you know, like I said, it, I, I've gotten a lot of credit for this personally and, and so did our team. But the truth is the only thing I did right was say yes to God's burden. Uh, God performed a miracle. And uh, uh, there was a series of events that happened. The access through the Joint Chiefs to be able to get to the airport, the, them willing to manifest our list to make sure we wouldn't bring out bad guys, and which is not what the Department of Defense did. They just took a mass amounts of people we man manifest in our list. Being able to bring people to another country in the Royal Family of the United Arab Emirates, giving us permission to bring people to humanitarian centers there. Uh, them giving us a C-17 plane, a large military plane, which is like about $2 million per flight they gave to us. And then Glenn Beck, all in three days, Glenn Beck calling me and saying, hey, I got a radio to raise money. And I raised twenty one million dollars. Like, what do I do with it? And I'm like, charter planes. And we partnered together with a uh, you know Mighty Oaks Foundation, Mercury One, and started the Save Our Allies camp, camp uh, campaign. And 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 ultimately, uh, you know, was able to pull all that off. And you know, everything was just chaotic and fast. And we were just like, if you stopped five minutes, like even if you're in an operations center or you're on the ground in Kabul, like if you stopped for five minutes, like you were literally trading for someone's life. It just was so fast. And in ten days, like the best example I give is like the environment was like sea spray. He lost 37 pounds in 10 days because he just would not stop moving to go get people. And, and, uh, I mean, the you chaos put that there. in a book, we could sell that as a diet book. We could all yeah. get rich. So. Yeah. You just, yeah. Don't stop moving. For, <laughs> don't stop moving for 10 days and don't, don't eat, don't drink water. Don't move. For, stop moving for 10 days and you lose 37 pounds. That's what, that's what he did. And he just, he was just like, it was almost like, I mean, obviously he was very composed and skilled, but a skilled guy, but he was just almost like, almost like fanatical. Like we, we have to keep going. We have to get these people out there. I mean, it, the, it was the level of chaos there and people seen the people fall off the planes and stuff like that. But like, it's easy in his family, like trying to get through eight times, trying to make it through there and what, and the Taliban shooting in the crowd for crowd control. I mean, people are being trampled to death. Mothers are kissing their babies goodbye. their infant babies. Cause they don't want to become a terrorist or, or, a, or a sex slave. They're kissing it goodbye, putting it on top of a crowd of a, 
hundred thousand people to be crowd surf like a beach ball. And then at the end, they were taking these babies and throwing them as hard and high as they could over the wall to land in, on the other side and hope an American service member would take it to freedom. What they didn't realize was on the other side, that wall was six feet high and 20 feet deep, a Constantino wire, and they were landing in the wires and, and bleeding out. My buddy Joe counted uh, six babies in there that were dead in that wire. And, and uh, that was like the level of chaos on the ground there was just, and, and, and so we we're trying to run these operations in that level of chaos. And on the 10th day, that's when the Abigate was blown up by a suicide bomber. 13 of our service members were killed. The military was forced to weld the gate shut. And, and when that happened, we knew that for us, the rescue operations were over because the military was leaving. But while the military was forced to leave and they didn't want to, we didn't have to. We, and we chose to stay for a lot of reasons. At that point, we had 12,000 people out. We knew so many people more were there. But it's back to that. I mean, it didn't matter if the White House was right with 100 or, or there was thousands. Like, we didn't want to, you don't leave one American behind. And we, we were not going to leave at that point. We just felt like God had still given us an open door opportunity. It was orchestrating the, the impossible, literally impossible to be there. Um, I mean, a lot of people in, in the, in, I mean, so many, they'd say 76% of the United States military were on their WhatsApp and, and trying to be involved and from veterans, like engaged. And so everybody wanted to do something, but God had given us the opportunity to be there. And, uh, and we didn't, we weren't going to squander that. So we just stayed, uh, led operation at a place called Mazda Sharif for two months. Uh, a lot of other organizations, Task Force Argo and Mercury, Samaritan's Purse, Mercury. A lot of people were involved. We were like leading this effort and got another 2,000, uh, uh, 5,000 people out. And then we, uh, and then from there, the last effort we did was the river operation and uh, across the Tajikistan border. Yeah, that's great. So, but you know, I, I want to come back to the Aziz story in a minute. But there's a parallel to that happening right now. Mm -hmm. The State Department's in charge of another evacuation and withdrawal. This time it's in Sudan. Same, same, same story. And yeah. It's the same narrative with the same <laughs> goofy numbers, and we're abandoning our people and our obligations again. Right. Well, they, they, the news you're going to see, see, see news right now. They're saying sixteen thousand Americans. But anybody that's ever traveled abroad knows that it's very rare that you register with the State Department. So that's sixteen thousand are registered with the State Department. My, uh, I, I think like one in three uh, Americans that travel abroad register with the State Department. So they could be upwards of you know, 50,000 there. We don't, we don't know how many are there, but what we do know is that last Saturday, and I don't know what day this is going out, but last Saturday from when we were recording this, so a week ago today, um, the U S special operations went in and evacuated a hundred embassy personnel, diplomats only. And then after that removal of the diplomats and we shut down our embassy, the, 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 the state department announced that they will not be doing any more withdrawal of, of, of U S personnel. And then they need to either shelter in place or self evacuate. And, uh, and, uh, and we have, again, have abandoned uh, our Americans in a, in a war zone. Uh, and we took that NEO operation and now the state department is running a NEO operation. And, uh, you know, the ambassador has no authority right now, uh, unless secretary Blinken gives it, we give it to him to, to activate the department of defense's, uh, you know, Marina expeditionary, expeditionary, uh, task force or the 82nd airborne. Um, and so that, that has been stripped away from them and Americans are stuck there. And you got, you got like a bioweapon lab there. You got the, you know, the rebels talking about using, using, yeah, yeah, I don't sense. even know why this is there, but you got the rebels talking about releasing Ebola and, and the measles and some, some other infectious disease. And, uh, you know, we have, we have Americans are being killed there. There's, there's reports of Americans being killed there. And then, uh, I mean, I mean, look, uh, you could always armchair quarterback things, but, uh, you know, I, I do I do know that a lot of people are saying that we even instigated this because of the Russians using that Sudan port, Sudanese port, and we we're in a proxy war. You know, the White House has drug us in a proxy war with Russia. And uh, so we've kind of instigated this, and now we moved out. Again, we moved out our military, moved out our embassy, we moved out our diplomats, and left Americans behind. And it, it could have been very easy to execute a NEO operation. If I was the commander-in-chief for a day, I would have executed a NEO operation and had the 82nd Airborne jump in, secure, secure the area, and had the Marine Expeditionary Task Force move, uh, maybe move in a, a, a carrier and, and move all the American citizens on their carrier uh, or off the coast of uh, or off the coast there and, and get our Americans safe. And that could have been done easily uh, if we had a little bit of courage in our in our. If, I have a feeling if you were Secretary of Defense for 24 hours, the world would shift. So <laughs> yeah. it'd be fun to watch. Yeah. But you know, I heard our governments tell, tell this, the people in Sudan to shelter in place. And I, I thought, what an incredibly irresponsible statement. We tried that in our culture. We had Amazon and DoorDash, yeah. and it was in, remarkably destructive for us as a people. Yeah. To say that to the people being left behind in Sudan, a war-torn country, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's beyond irresponsible. It's, it, it is, it's a, delega uh, it's a, uh, a dereliction of the most 
basic fundamental duty uh, of, the, of the of the commander in chief uh, of the president of the United States to protect American citizens. That is his. The president of the United States, and this isn't a partisan statement. It doesn't matter if President Trump's in the White House or Joe Biden or, or President Obama. Or it doesn't matter. The president of the United States' primary responsibility is to keep every American safe. Uh, that's that's his job, and uh, and to willfully and intentionally walk away from sixteen thousand Americans in a combat zone is a dereliction of his duty. And to me, to me, to me, it's 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 a, it's a treasonous act, and that's a big word, and we throw that word around a lot in politics right now. But it, it is is a it is a treasonous act to walk away from our people like that. Well, and it signals to the whole world, both our allies and our enemies, that we're not trustworthy. We're not trustworthy. We don't keep our word. Yeah. Uh, and why would anybody with Afghanistan, why would anyone uh, ever uh, be a local national force to support American efforts o- abroad? We, we, we uh, you know, far from not a word. Um, but there are some happy endings in this narrative. You've got a book out, Saving Aziz. We'll let you tell more about that. So... You you mobilized a dozen of your buddies and you go back in country mm-hmm. to get your friend and you're hiding from the Taliban, Aziz. That cannot be a pleasant window for you and your family. Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, it was really risky and dangerous for me and my family. Since 2007, I was a target of the Taliban. CIA knows about this. United States government knows about this. Even President Biden, I think at that time he was the vice president. That report was in his hand. So I was a target, obviously, for the bad guys. And suddenly I noticed that the country was handed over to the bad guys. And they are coming and violating the Doha agreement. They are killing and torturing and raping. And they have no mercy on nobody. So... uh, I was really scared and uh, I had no other option but just to use my military experience. I got all my guns out, AK-47s, grenades and ammunitions and magazines. And uh, while I was living in a uh, five-story concrete house, I put like, uh, identified some places as a check post and I told my wife that this is the gun and these are the grenades. This is how you use them. If they come from this corner, you're using this corner. And the same thing, the other corner, other corner for my older son, for my older daughter, and I was managing two, three other uh, posts. So, but still, it was not enough. I had bodyguards from the Afghan government, like from 2007 after they gave me bodyguards because of what I was doing was really risky for my children and my family. So my kids, when they go to school at that time, they were escorted to school by the bodyguards. Even my bodyguards, they dropped the guns and they told me, they called me boss. They're like, hey boss, it's not possible. We cannot do it. They are a lot. We are less. They ran away from me. My parents, they called me. They're like, hey, Aziz, it's your decision. You worked for the Americans. Now you handle it. You're not coming our way because you are harming your brothers and their wives and children. And my relatives told me the same thing. They're like, you're not coming to our house. If you come here, you are harming us and yourself. You are already a target. So it's your thing. You figure it out. And uh, Chad is trying to uh, bring me to the United States since 2016. Some other American brothers that I served with in Afghanistan, they are trying to bring me to the United States, but because of the contract I served uh, in Afghanistan, the version is classified. Every time we file the application, we ask the USCIS to issue a visa for me and my family, the special immigrant visa. They respond back, they're like, where is your DOD contract number? Where is this? Where is that? All those bureaucratic process, you know, and uh, nobody can give me that. So I had no other option but just to bow on my knees. And I remembered a lesson because I was born uh, to a Muslim family. And uh, I was taught that over 124,000 uh, prophets came to this world and most of all of them died. There was only one prophet who was born through the Holy Spirit of God. And <clears throat> when his mission was done, he was ascended alive to heaven and he is coming back. And then I remembered that my American brothers, uh, they are worshiping God through Jesus Christ. I bowed on my knees and I start crying and praying with a humble heart in a very desperate situation. I mean, feel yourself in that position when you are watching that all over there is bad guys. They are coming. Your daughters are in danger. Your wife is in danger. There is no help. Nothing is working for you. 
the guns, the concrete building or money, nothing is working. So I cried and prayed under Jesus' name and I asked him that I never followed you the way you wanted to follow me uh, because I was born to a different geography. I didn't know about you. Now I remember all the lessons from my childhood and my heart is feeling that you can hear me and you are alive, you are in the heaven. Please ask your father that I'm in a desperate need of his help. He can do it. You have shown me miracles in my life and I need it again. Please show me another miracle. Save my life and wherever I go, I will spread the news about you that you are real. God is real. Miracles are true. Prayers can change your life. And uh, all you got to do is uh, to be honest to yourself and humble. So I did this repeatedly and repeatedly. And then I got tired because a few nights before that, I couldn't sleep because of, out of fear. And I there was a mattress and a pillow. I told my wife that you guys take care of the check posts. I'm taking a nap. And then if anything happens, wake me up. So I put my head on this pillow, on the mattress. I lie down. I put my AK-47 in my bosom. And uh, I saw a dream that suddenly the whole sky of Afghanistan turns into black and it starts raining, cloudy. It's uh, the, the clouds are so uh, um, noisy that uh, I even my ears could not tolerate that noise. I thought that my ears are the curtains of my ears blowing up. It was that. Uh, loud and that scary. And uh, suddenly I noticed that uh, my family is standing on a very small portion of dry land. The rest of the world or the country of Afghanistan is full of water because of all this shower that's coming from sky. And I saw myself that I was swirling and drowning in the water up to my neck and uh, helpless, disappointed, paralyzed, not able to speak. Suddenly I remembered Jesus again and I asked him in my heart through my breathing because I cannot talk. And I look at the sky very helpless and very, uh, you know, uh, disappointing situation that I'm not, uh, because I have no other future. I see death to myself and I, my daughters are crying. They can do nothing. So I asked him once again for help. And suddenly a big, a, a very loud noise <clears throat> tore in the sky. A human hand full of water came over me. This is the time that actually kids are running around, planes are dropping bombs, soldiers are full of blood. And you know, it's 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 like as if it is the World War One or two, it's like that. And when I saw this hand, I don't know what to show you. Like that hand was very big and I got really scared. I squeezed myself uh, to myself and I asked God, oh, please uh, do not touch me with that hand. Please help me some other way. And suddenly at this time, uh, I don't know what it was, turns my neck to my left side. I see there is a black wall that a boat comes it hits the wall. It's a wall full of, uh, made of bricks, black bricks, and it's on the water. When the ship or boat hits it, it has a sail on it. Behind the ship wheel, there is my brother, American brother, Daniel Stenson uh, from Virginia, who served with me in Chad in Afghanistan. And Chad is in the middle of uh, the boat pulling the rope and he's telling me, hey, hang on, brother. And Dan told me in this very rough Texan voice, he's like, Aziz, my brother. He's having a cowboy hat, a chain and tattoos. Hang on, tough, we are coming. I'm like, please hurry up. I cannot talk, but through my feelings, I'm saying this. So Chad's like, hey, hang on, tough. I know you can do it. We're coming. They arrive. And they uh, reach my hand and they pull me to the boat. You know, Chad is tapping on my shoulder. He's like, are you okay, man? Are you okay, man? I'm, I couldn't talk. I'm coughing and I'm really tired and exhausted. And my spiritual body is about to die. I'm losing energy. My legs are shaking. So suddenly at this time, uh, something happens in my house. The window in the kitchen is open. There is a metal bowl sitting on the kitchen table. And I don't know if it is the cat or the wind. It blows this metal uh, bowl. It uh, drops on the concrete floor and it makes a very bad other noise, which is near to my ear. And this wakes me up from the dream. When I wake up, 
I'm uh, like, I look around and I see that the AK-47 is in my hand and I get even more scared. I'm like, what's this? What was that? Oh my gosh, that was only a dream. I get more nervous, more scared. And I see a dark future for my children. I quickly run away, uh, go check all the floors. I check my daughters. I check my wife. I see everyone is uh, uh, falling asleep. They're sleeping. And then uh, I come, I turn on the TV. I see that now the bad guys are even in Kabul. They are running around. I open the window. Outside the window, they shot the Afghan National Army soldiers right in front of my house, like in, in the distance of 50 meters, like five zero meters. They killed a bunch of Afghan National Army soldiers just because those soldiers didn't want to give up their guns or the military vehicles. And I got even more scared and nervous. So I'm waiting and I know Chad is trying to find a way to bring me in, but uh, it's not happening because he's not a government guy. And, you know, um, uh, he's trying since 2016. So. I'm running around and I'm saying in my heart that God is great. Uh, God's angels uh, are here to protect me. I'm repeating this and feeding my uh, spiritual body with the spiritual food. So uh, uh, suddenly after, uh, I don't know if it was a couple hours or a few hours, Chad calls me. He calls me and he tells me, hey, as he's my brother, I'm in Washington, D.C., talking to some very high-ranked people. They know exactly how much sacrifice you give for this beautiful nation. They have your documents, and we are trying to put a team together to come to Afghanistan, save you and your family. And he said, God loves you. So uh, this actually, uh, something clicked in my mind. I remembered the dream, and I remembered the prayer, and I'm like, why the chat tells me God loves you? So just suddenly something happened in my body that my body was kind of when you plug in the phone to keep it charged. So my body started receiving the charge again or the energy or the power. And after that, a few hours, Daniel Stenson calls me. And actually Chad also told me that Daniel Stenson and Joe Robert is on their way to Abu Dhabi. They are talking to the royal family because I don't have a visa. They cannot bring me directly to United States. They needed a secondary place for temporary time to bring me for the safety first, then process my visa. However, Dan calls me. He's like, hey, Aziz, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> he is like that. So he's like... I'm in Abu Dhabi and uh, I need you to do me a recon. Go outside all around the U.S. Embassy, the Kabul airport. This is the time that the embassy is closed. They burned all the documents. Everyone is at the airport. The airport is full of crowd and, you know, bad guys are in the city and it is very risky. So I got my AK and pistol and I cannot even use my cards. And I called a taxi driver who is my friend. I wrapped up myself in a scarf. I went around the Kabul airport. I did this recon by taking pictures, uh, like how many entrances, exits, the same thing uh, for the U.S. embassy, the roads. And, you know, I've made like a presentation and send it to Dano. We put him back to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah from that time. Well on. trained. Yeah. <laughs> like, back, so, picked up where we left off. <laughs> so for me, this was a God's miracle and this was God's timing and this was his plan. And once I was rescued and I was brought to Abu Dhabi humanitarian city, when I was in the humanitarian city, I uh, volunteered my time working for the 17,000 people that was saved because of us or within the same package. So my daughters, my sons, you know, they were also uh, volunteering their time. And uh, he became the president of, uh, we call them, we called it Raccoon City. Yeah. Okay, he's the president of Raccoon City. Like yeah. he literally took a, took over and was like yeah. organized everything. Yeah, somebody had to do it because there was no cl <laughs> clear instructions. The U.S. Embassy didn't know where to start, where to end. The UEE Ministry of Health didn't know where to start, where to end because like there was more than 13 vaccines needed for all, yeah. for all these Afghans to be processed for visa. And the same thing with the Afghan Embassy. Most of them were soldiers like the uh, Special Forces, the, the Zero Unit guys that were trained by the CIA out of fear they, they burned all their documents, like their passports, ID cards, before even coming to, to Kabul. Like, for example, they had to risk their lives, drive from Badakhshan province for nine hours to get to Kabul, to get to Kabul airport. So they had to uh, take uh, 
destroy all their um, ID cards. And then I asked the Afghan ambassador to uh, create documents for them, like outpasses or travel documents, so that the U.S. embassy can issue them visa. Because if you don't have a passport, <laughs> where would you get the visa stamped on? However, it was a miracle of God. And uh, when I came to uh, America, I spent a couple of months and uh, um, actually a couple of weeks in Washington, D.C., Virginia. And then uh, I came to uh, Texas. When I first landed in Texas, I stood with six, ch six children, one wife, a backpack, zero dollar in my po pocket. I don't have a US SIM card. I don't know how to use the Uber app. I have no uh, <laughs> familiarization or acquaintance with all these different things. Like when uh, wherever you go, sign up here, sign up there. There's lots of sign-ups here. There but are lots I, of sign-ups. <laughs> however, so I'm standing in the crossroads and, you know, I have a big wound. My spiritual body is really wounded. Chad, uh, I told Chad that, what should I do, brother? He sent me to the Mighty Oaks main legacy program. When, when I went to the main legacy program, that actually gave me a lot of healing. And it fixed my spiritual body. And it gave me energy and hope and faith. So behind my wall uh, on the room that they gave me in the Mighty Oaks ranch, uh, that every night when I went there, there was uh, this sign. It was written, Jeremiah 6.16. I'm like, one day I thought with myself, what is this? Every morning when I come, my eyes are contacting this. Every evening when I come, my eyes are contacted, contacted this. So uh, suddenly I told to myself, let me Google it. When I Googled it, this is exactly uh, this uh, Jeremiah 6.16 told me, stand at the crossroads, ask for the ancient path, ask where the good way is, Walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said we will not walk in it. Now, let me explain this. Thinking about the dream, asking about the prayer, thinking about my childhood, and looking at this translation, this is exactly matching my situation. I'm standing at the crossroads. As I said, I have nothing. I lost everything. I don't know where to go. Forward, backward, right, left. So this guided me. This Jeremiah 6.16 guided me. And that was actually the time that I realized that God is real. Prayers can change your life. And miracles are true. And that's exactly when I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. If everybody Amen. listening could accept those three statements, it'd change yeah. our nation. It would ch yeah, change the world. It would. Yeah. It would change the whole world. So, yeah, so when we wrote this book, uh, Saving wrote, is ease. I wrote it eight weeks after. Uh, I had eight. Thomas Nelson asked me to do it eight weeks after the last year back. So, so much has happened since then. Uh, you know, this was written before uh, Aziz surrendered his life to Christ, and uh, and so there's so much still there uh, to be told. But this is a, you know really incredible account of, uh, of the rescue operation, getting his yeah. back, getting those 17,000 people out. And it also is a, is a chronological series of events of, of, uh, of what actually happened, uh, during the withdrawal from the decisions made by the white house. And, and I would say, even though, you know, I'm probably known to be a con very conservative patriotic person. Uh, I do believe it's a, it's unbiased, uh, like nonpartisan, I'm just telling the facts of what happened. In fact, the Pentagon had for five months and did heavy redactions on it. So anything that's in there, uh, that's that, one of my favorite true. parts. The Pentagon had it and they wouldn't release it before the midterm elections. Yeah, that's right. They held and it. And then they've redacted this. There's all these black lines in it, but you printed it with all the redactions still yeah. visible. What I told them was if they were redacting <laughs> things that I didn't believe were classified and I believe were, uh, were political, then I would leave the black lines in there. And, and they did. And I did too. So, so the book is saving Aziz. <laughs> Hollywood's made a living the last few years out of making movies about superheroes that are fictional. And I'm telling you, Chad Robichaud and Aziz are the a story of some heroes that are real. You don't need Hollywood to make this story up. I uh, thank you for your courage. You, you started the Mighty Oaks Foundation, which is making a difference now for all sorts of veterans and active military 
How do folks find out more information about that? Uh, you go to mightyoaksprograms.org. Uh, if you're a veteran, active duty service member, first responder, spouse, uh, we have programs uh, at our five different ranches around the country. We have resiliency programs that are based around the world. We've spoken about half a million troops there. Uh, we have uh, recovery programs at these ranches, and they're a week-long, non- uh, non-clinical, faith-based, peer-to-peer mentoring wildly successful. God just uh, does amazing things there. If anybody listening needs those programs, again, totally free. We even pay for the travel. Uh, we are here to serve you. Like if you're struggling, you know, I think the biggest message I get today is you're not alone. You don't have to do it alone. You weren't created to do it alone. And uh, there is support for you. And we, we'd love to help out. Chad, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, You are an inspiration to a generation. I pray what you have shown us becomes contagious and spreads across our nation. Aziz, I think you're going to make a great Texan. Yeah. Yes. All right, we're going to work on that accent a little bit, yeah. but you got the character for it, I he's, promise. He's got the cowboy hat and the cowboy boots, and he, yeah. he's eating his barbecue every day. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the essentials in place. Yes. God bless you guys. God bless you, Pastor Alice. Thank you. Thank you.